going to look at a parable in Matthew, Mark, Luke, three Gospels give this parable. It's the parable of the sower, and it's a very familiar one. If you've been in Sunday school or taught Sunday school, it's probably one of the first that we teach the children. It's got a lot of visual in it, and kids like stories, and they like visuals. So I think we'll use Mark 4, which is a succinct look at the parable. And why don't we just read it first, and then we'll talk about it. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. Again means that he'd had a long storytelling day. He'd done nothing, actually, but tell stories to thousands of people. Do you know how tiring that is? And especially with families and children uh, with them and no microphone to help him. But another gospel tells us that he got into a boat, this is on Galilee, in order to tell this story. Now, we know he got into a boat in Luke chapter 5 when he uh, called Peter to leave his nets and follow him. I wasn't aware until I studied this that there's another time he gets into a boat, and it's here. He gets into a boat on Galilee, and the people, it says, are standing on the shore. And that's in another gospel account of this. The crowd that gathered around him was so large, he got into a boat, sat in it, out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. And he taught them many things by parables. In his teaching, he said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they didn't bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was given to them. Others like seed sown on rocky places. They hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others are like seeds sown among thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And others are like seeds sown on good soil. Hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. This is a teachable moment. Those of you who have children or have been children yourself, your parents have taken opportunities to give you a teachable moment. I remember Stuart having a teachable moment with our grandkids when they were young once. We are on a little reedy weedy lake, good fishing lake, and he was down there with two of our grandsons, probably nine, 10, 11 age. And they both wanted to cast at the same piece of land. Well, actually, it was a dock. And they both wanted to stand on one side of the dock because they thought that was the best side. And they were nudging each other. And Stuart said, one of you come over here. You're going to get your lines tangled. No, no, no. You know, and they started arguing. And so in the end, he said to one of them, Dan, over here, <laughs> putting a real grandpa voice on and Danny stomped over to the other side, threw his, 
fishing line in the water. As soon as it touched the water, a fish took it. And he said, oh, I got a fish, I've got a fish, I've got a fish. And Stuart said, well, go and reel it in, reel it in. And he got all excited. And then, apparently, coming off a story he'd heard in Sunday school, he turns over his shoulder and he says to Stuart, you're a bit like Jesus, aren't you, Papa? <laughs> and uh, then he said, and I'm a bit like Peter. And Stuart said, teachable moment, why do you say that? And Danny got it before Stuart applied it. I don't like doing what I'm told. Peter didn't like doing what he was told. Teachable moments, and they talked about it. Teachable moments, Jesus used them all the time. And usually he used a story. He was a master storyteller. Having just been in a part of the world where storytelling is part of the fabric of that society and has been for thousands and thousands of years, I'm reminded that a good storyteller is a wonderful way to scatter seed of the gospel. And all of us need to learn how to do that. So, the teachable moment, the end of a long storytelling day. Jesus had been using parable after parable after parable. If you put all the gospels together that talk about this incident, just go and look what had happened before. He has had an incredibly long day. And crowds and crowds of people changing the image, using the story to get attention. And at this point, getting into a boat so that the water in between himself and the crowd would act as a microphone and take that sound and magnify it. He didn't have the advantage we have of all the modern things we have in our society. And so here's the master teacher. The master teacher used many, many, many different ways to teach. My, um, my work hundreds of years ago at university was in words, actually. Words are weapons for good or ill. I often tell people I heard Churchill's speeches putting vibrant guts into the British people as we waited for the invasion to start, which was absolutely certain, so we were told. And I heard Churchill's famous speech myself. They're coming, there's nothing we can do to stop them, but we'll fight on the beaches, we'll fight house to house, we'll fight hand to hand, we'll never surrender. And I also read in the newspapers Hitler's speeches. One for good, one for ill. Hitler's words took the world nearly into hell. Churchill's words, good words, strengthen the people that were trying to stop it. Words are weapons for good or ill. And I remember in my training, it wasn't what to teach. My trainings in education, it was how people learn. And I realized that God was giving me some palace training. I always think of Moses having palace training in Pharaoh's palace for everything he'd have to do to keep a million and a half people alive in a desert. And he got it in Pharaoh's palace. Palace training, everything that goes to make our background what it is, secular or otherwise, God will use. And I thank God for the training I had at Cambridge that taught me to ask the big question, who's in front of me? How do they learn? How do they learn? And then apply in the method of teaching how they learn. Jesus did that. Master teacher. Parables are earthy stories with a heavy meaning, a child said when asked, what is a parable? Very good, actually. An earthy story, something down to earth, something common with a heavy meaning or a heavenly meaning, we could say. Parables are like riddles. And the East was full of riddles, proverbs, wisdom literature. A riddle was a puzzle. It was words giving people mind work to do. What Jesus taught was important because it had eternal significance, but he wrapped it up in a story to get people's attention. So that's one way Jesus taught. Another way he taught was big long word, peripatetic. I was listening to Stuart teach on this last trip, 
and he was explaining to pastors what that big long word meant. It means walking around. It just means walking around. And the rabbis in Jesus' day, and Jesus as a master teacher, would just walk around. And as they would walk around, they'd say, oh, look at the birds. Or, look at that city on a hill. It's going dark, and it's all lit up. A city set on a hill can't be hid. And if you just take Jesus' gospel, just take one gospel, follow his sandals through the gospel, probably take you about 30 minutes to read from one end to the other. And just see how Jesus walked around and his people followed him. Follow me, follow me. If they wanted to learn anything, they had to follow him physically. And Jesus used a peripatetic, walking around method of teaching. He also used parables. Ponder the parable deep in your head. Use your ears, he kept saying. Think! I remember again my husband sitting our small grandchildren, that's quite a while ago now, they're mostly in their 20s now, but he sat our small grandchildren down and I have no idea what was going on, but I heard him say, nobody has ever died of thinking. I thought, my word. <laughs> so I put my head round and the kids were sort of <laughs> looking at Papa. So I have no idea what engendered this, this uh, little lecture, <laughs> whatever it was. Um, and then he said, many people have died without it. And so there's another long silence while the children <laughs> took this in. But he was trying to tell them to use their mind. And one of the children, interestingly, said to Papa, and must have been on how much TV they were watching or something, um, well, didn't you watch TV, Papa? I mean, you must have watched TV. You must have learned, watched TV. And Stuart said it wasn't invented when I was young. So all these little eyes turn wonderingly to Papa. <laughs> it wasn't invented. And one of them said, what did you do? <laughs> yes. What did you do? And Stuart said, oh, funny things like read and think. <laughs> so the story and the parable was continuing, whatever it was. So thinking, Jesus was always saying, you've got ears to hear. That didn't mean just the, ver the, the sound waves. It meant think, think. And a riddle was a way to get them thinking. What's the answer to this riddle, this play on words? So ponder the parable deep in your head, said Jesus. Heavenly story with an earthly meaning. I was reading a wonderful book called Spurgeon's Letters to His Students. It's about a famous preacher in Britain who is quite famous in our country. And he had an evening Bible school for pastors. And they were very poor. They didn't have any money for any books uh, except a Bible. That was it. And so at night, he would go back and talk about how to put a sermon together and what to do when you didn't have books at all to help you to train you. And it's called uh, Spurgeon's Letters to His Students. And he talks about this thinking. Truth that needs thinking about, Spurgeon is talking about. And he said, I asked a little girl once who asked me, what is my soul? What is my soul? And he said, what do you think it is to this child? And she said, my soul is my think. I like that. My soul is my think. Spurgeon replied, Methinks too many people have too little soul. In other words, too many people don't think. So the mind is incredibly important when we're listening to Jesus. Our mind is incredibly important. You mind your mind. God will mind your heart. I'm afraid in America all we want is attention to our heart, to our emotions, to our feelings. And uh, no, we mind our mind, God will mind our heart. And actually what we do with our mind is we take the seed of the word of God and let it bring righteousness into our life. That's what Paul says, the word of God scattered in our own souls is meant to do, bring forth the fruit of righteousness. As that happens, we'll, we'll need to think. We'll need to mind our mind, and God will look after the rest in our emotions and our feelings. So this farmer, 
The son of God, it says in one of the other passages, is the farmer. Jesus is now explaining the parable to people. The farmer is the son of God, who is the word himself. In the beginning was the word, and the word was what? Was God. The word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made, etc. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Modern translation, moved into the neighborhood. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Our neighborhood, our world. Wonderful. He was the word. Jesus was the word. But Jesus also said, the word of God, the written word of God, is the seed. And over and over again, he is quoting the Old Testament scriptures. That's all he had. That was his Bible. New Testament, of course, hadn't been written. And so the farmer is the son of God who is the word himself. But he wants to use this picture of the seed as this word of God as he's teaching the people now. And he sends out his workers into the world, tells you about that in Matthew 28, who scatter the seed which takes root and brings a harvest of life, righteousness, etc., etc. You need to look up Galatians 6, 6 to 10. Gives you reason for the seed taking root in our lives and bringing forth the likeness of Christ. You can't do it without the word of God and obedience to it. Doesn't work any other way. So Jesus, the great farmer, was sowing his teaching of the kingdom in the crowds. He was plowing it in with illustration and story. And then, of course, he was weeping over it in his own prayer time with his father. He was watering it with his tears. And he harvested some of the first fruits, people. And after Pentecost, he expanded his farming operation globally globally. And so Jesus is the farmer. But then there's the farmhands, that you and me, the people who live on the farm. We're the farmhands, the team of workers called to follow him, both men and women. Look in Luke chapter 8. Twelve men called as the apostles to follow him and begin to watch him scatter the seed and to do it themselves. And in Luke chapter 8, women are added to that team. Just a list of them there. Mary Magdalene, Susanna. Three or four women mentioned. You need to find out who they were. Um, unheard of that a rabbi would travel with women until Jesus did it. Radical. But he added women to his team to help with the crowds, to look after the babies and the people that came who were sick. Not just to do that, but to scatter some seed himself, themselves. Yes, he was talking to us the other day and he was telling this story and, and it was about this and that and, and the other. And they too, as they helped with the crowd control, as they helped talk to people, as the crowds, it said town after town after town were coming. There is nothing more exhausting than crowds, I can tell you. There is nothing more exhausting than people. And at this rate, and so the team grows as Jesus continues to spread the word and proclaim the truth. And what about the farmland? What about the soil? Here we see it represents the crowd, the variety of people Jesus is talking about in here. And we read how they represent people that have thorns in their lives and all of that. And I will address that in a further talk about uh, the enemy of our souls and how he robs us of the seed and tries to mess it up even though we receive it. In another passage of scripture, Jesus says, look at the fields, they're white. Look at the fields, they're waiting. They're waiting to be sown. Often people ask us when we come back from a trip like we've just done, uh, it seems so dark and difficult out there. People seem so angry and so uh, vicious when they hear the gospel. Is this true? Well, that's there. But the seed that falls on the good ground is all among the bad ground. Think about a field. There's everything there. 
there's the stones, there's the weeds, there's, there's everything there, but there's the good soil too. It's all mixed up together. And so Jesus said they're white, they're ready for harvest. They don't look like it may be, but they are. I think of my own heart just before I ever met Christ. I was waiting for somebody to sow some seed in my life. I didn't look like it. I didn't sound like it. I looked like the last person in, in the earth up there as a student that would be interested. But inside, all the time, I'm crying, if only somebody would sow my soil, if only somebody would put or say something in my life that makes sense. And, and I was just waiting. That's all soil can do. It's just waiting for somebody to care enough to go and sow some seed in our lives. And they're white and they're waiting. White and waiting, those two words. I think of Stuart and I in our coffee bar days when we just walk into one of these places and that youth work we did for all those years, just cold turkey. And I remember the young man after Stuart had been in that dark place all evening answering questions of all these kids. And I remember him saying, well, I've got to go now, mister. And by the way, I don't believe a word you've told me. And Stuart said, what? This was after hours. Why don't you believe a word I've told you? And he said, because what you've told us is so incredible that if it was really true, People like you would have been down here a lot sooner to tell us kids. That's why I don't believe. That's why I don't believe. I think of the people we've just been with who spent many times in much, many years in Asia, who told me heartbreaking stories of tribal people that came over the mountains and the mountains and the mountains to one tribe who had received the good news of God. And this they'd heard from traders and they'd gone up and this people group actually had never been reached by anybody but they heard that gods had come to earth. That's what they heard, the gods had come to earth. And they told all the secret of the gods to this people group. And so they left their homeland, a mountain and a mountain. They said a moon and a moon away. And they brought animals and they brought beautiful homemade clothes from the skins of animals and they brought food, they brought their wealth, and they arrived in this people group who in its entirety had come to Christ. It had taken about 10 years of living there and working there. In fact, two of our missionaries that we still support were the ones that took their little family and did that work. And they came to the elders of the village and they said, who are you? And they said, we live a moon and a moon away and all of this. And we heard the gods had come to earth and they said, well, what is all this for? And they said, in essence, we have come to buy a missionary. Is this enough? If, if this isn't enough so we can buy a missionary so we can hear the gods and the story that you've got to tell, we'll go back and we'll get more. We'll bring everything we've got. Wow. The fields are white and the fields are waiting. Yes, they are. And Jesus said we need to get out there and sow them. So where do we start? The mission feels between our own two feet at any one time. That's what I was told the day I came to Christ in hospital. And the girl that led me to the Lord, who happened to be a nurse in the next bed to me, said, everybody that comes to your bedside today, Jill, you tell them what you just did. She pushed me into it. Now I began to scatter seed. I had no idea what I'm doing. But listen, how hard is it to chuck seed over people? I was giving this once somewhere at Elmbrook, I can't remember when it was, and a friend of mine, Elizabeth Murphy, who is a Bible teacher herself now, who goes out and scatters seed over everybody, was listening to me. And she had a neighbor who she had been very carefully for years putting one little seed in her neighbor's drink <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and this had gone on and on and on. and. Um, she listened to me, and to my horror, she told me the next week, Jill, I listened to you, and I thought, this isn't going to be. She said, I went home, I filled my basket with seed, I went over to my neighbor, I knocked on the door, and I chucked it all over her. <laughs> I said, Elizabeth, what happened? She said, she's sitting there, I brought her today. <laughs> How hard is it? 
How hard is it to just do this? We don't have to make it grow. We can't do that. It says in Corinthians, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, only God can make it grow. All we have to do is chuck it, scatter it, and don't worry about it. Oh, it shouldn't be there. That's the sort of ground that doesn't want it. And put it back in your basket. Just so, 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 so. I remember my doctor coming to Christ in 1970 here in America and his beautiful wife and their children. And it wasn't long before he packed up and went to South America for the rest of his life. And they served a wonderful mission out there. And I remember his wife, which she still writes to me, wonderful letters. Uh, he is now in heaven. But I remember her saying, Jill, this is absolutely beautiful. It's a dark place. I'm glad we're here. They were with the radio station, HCJB, actually. And he was the doctor for the whole missionary community for the rest of his life. And she said, um, we go down in town a lot, and it's pretty grim down there, and it's an open sewer, and there's, it's dirty, and it's, it's disease-ridden, and we're working down there and trying to help the people. And she said, we pass this garbage pile. It's just the garbage pile for the whole city, and it stinks. You can smell it a mile away. She said, it's actually smoking. And she said, we, we can't get to this village any other way to do some clinic work, but we have to go past this garbage pile. And she said, one day as I was walking past it, I looked and said, Jack, look, look at that. And there in the middle of the garbage pile, was an orchid, beautiful orchid. And she wrote to me and she said, only God can grow an orchid on a garbage pile. But the seed somehow had fallen from the orchid that climbed up the tree because they're, you know, they're, they're, they, um, what's the word? I can't remember. Parasites, Parasites thank you. And uh, the seeds had been taken to the garbage pile and it found a little bit of good soil a little bit of good soil. On this trip, I've had people say to me, in essence, I'm just a garbage pile. I've lived on a garbage pile. I've been infected by the garbage pile. But then the seed of God was sown in my heart. Somebody came from your part of the world, and they cared enough to scatter the seed, even on the garbage pile. And the seed found the good soil, which it always will. And there's the orchid. Do we believe in the power of the seed of the Word of God, or do we not? And so, what's our excuse? Is it more comfortable to stay in the farmhouse and watch TV, play with our games? Don't miss a sowing season. A farmer can never miss a sowing season. Very important. So somebody can come along one day and harvest to the glory of God. Amen.